Our last topic in this section is uh, energy applications or how we use energy and how we can look at energy in various categories. We're going to begin first off by looking at solar energy sources and what this means is energy sources that we use on the planet that originally have the sun as the source of their energy. For, for example, if we look here at wind energy, what makes the wind move? Well, the wind is moved by the uneven heating of the Earth's atmosphere by solar radiation. So wind energy, really, when you trace it back, is solar energy. Uh, what about fossil fuels? Well, if you'll recall, coal and, and oil were all made from previous living plants and animals. Well, plants and animals, of course, originally derive all their energy from the sun through the process of photosynthesis. So fossil fuels are, are, have a solar energy source. It's just been buried in the earth for a very, very, very long time. Uh, solar panels, of course, are pretty obvious. That's a direct solar energy source where the sunlight's converted directly into electricity. Hydroelectric power is also solar-based because, again, what allows the water to get around the planet and collect in, in lakes and rivers? Well, it comes down as rain, and rain came from condensation in clouds, and those clouds were made by the evaporation of water from the surface of the Earth. Well, what's evaporating the water, of course, is solar radiation. Biomass means burning... Um, or deriving energy from biological materials, and this may include uh, biofuels like using ethanol or alcohol, uh, or even just a simple act of, uh, of lighting a fire using wood. That, that's using biomass. Well, of course, all biomass, all living things on the planet, can trace themselves back to the plants which use photosynthesis, and of course, plants get their photosynthesis from the sun. Then we have non-solar sources. So the sun's not involved on these ones. Here's one that you may not have thought of, geothermal. Now you probably know that deeper inside the Earth, it can get incredibly hot. Well, here's a technique where we inject cold water down into these hot zones, and it gets heated up by the Earth, and it comes back up very, very hot, uh, even in the form of steam. We then use the steam to once again uh, spin a turbine, the turbine is connected to a generator. The generator makes electricity. So here's an example of a geothermal plant. And as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of steam being released by it uh, from this process. Another example of a non-solar energy source is tidal energy. So this roadway here across the water is actually a, a, a tidal power generating uh, uh, ro uh, device. If you look underneath it here, you can see that beneath the roadway, what we have is water that travels through this uh, this pipe here and in the middle we have a turbine well once again here we go you've got a turbine the flow of water makes the turbine spin the spinning turbine is connected to a electrical generator we make electricity so as the tide comes in and the tide goes out we capture that moving water to make a turbine spin it's also interesting to note that uh, tides go in and out they do this two times a day so not only can you catch the energy from the water as it comes in, but you can also do the reverse later on when the water goes out. Uh, we've already talked about uh, nuclear power plants, and so here we see the cooling towers of a nuclear plant where the cooling water is allowed to condense again to be reused. And we've already looked at the innards of a, of a can-do reactor where the tremendous heat that's generated inside the reactor itself is used to create steam. The steam then goes to a turbine, making it spin. The turbine is then connected to a generator, and of course that's how we make electrical energy. Meanwhile, we take that water and condense it back and, and reuse it again. So these are all non-solar. We can also look at energy sources uh, in terms of, never mind solar and non-solar, we can look at uh, renewable and non-renewable. And as the name would suggest, renewable energy represents a form of energy that can be used again and again and again and again. It, it replenishes itself, whereas non-renewable is not. Once you've used up that energy source, uh, you're not going to get any more. There's a limited supply. So, for example, under renewal, we have such things as solar power. As long as the sun keeps shining, we've got solar power. Wind, it's renewable. The wind keeps on blowing. We keep on making power. Uh, water, likewise. Geothermal, also. Tidal energy, biomass, these are all renewable. Now, they may not be constant. So, for example, it's not always windy, so you can't always use a wind turbine. So there are some downsides to these. Non-renewable ones include the fossil fuels, the ones that use coal, oil, natural gas. We know that fossil fuels were made millions of years ago by plants and animals that were buried under sediments. We're digging them up at a tremendous rate, and we're burning them. 
Well, we know darn well that we're burning them far, far faster than new fossil fuels are being created. And so at some point, the, the supply is going to give out. The same thing with nuclear power. Uh, nuclear generators rely upon such minerals as uranium. Well, there's only so much uranium on the Earth, and it's going to be harder and harder to find it as time goes by. Where it gets kind of interesting is if, if you look at how the world uses its uh, power, here's some data taken from 2010 that shows us uh, basically the, the fossil fuels, the non-renewables shown here in brown, uh, compared to the renewables shown here in green. And you can sort of see right here that the, uh, the renewable wedge in this pie graph is, is pretty small. It's, it's only not even a quarter of what we use fossil fuels for. So fossil fuels are very, very popular. And that's probably because we got a lot of technology to get up uh, natural gas and oil and coal from the ground. And we're very good at it, I guess. We've been doing it for quite some time. So it's still very, very popular. Some of the renewables are harder to develop. If you look at the renewables and break them down, you can see uh, what goes on here that it's a much smaller bunch of slivers like if you look at these numbers here pretty tiny uh, in other words a lot of our renewable methods of generating uh, energy haven't really taken off they're certainly not uh, as uh, as predominant as uh, the fossil fuel technologies that we've developed and this could be a cause of concern right we know that fossil fuels aren't going to last forever so what are we going to do right at some point we've got to develop new sources of energy that are renewable another thing that's kind of interesting to look at is if we look at the earth or the planet itself and say well who's using this energy some things become very very clear we can see, for example, that uh, the developed countries, like here's Canada and the USA, uh, here we see Europe and we see places like Norway. Now, it's a cold country up there. Uh, places like Australia. These countries that are very well developed, we see that, boy, they sure do use a, a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, are they using their fair share? Well, you, you might want to wonder about that because if we actually have a look at population growth and if we compare the developing countries compared with the industrialized ones, of which Canada would be a member, we can see that our population is not growing very, very fast, uh, whereas the, the developing countries, their population is growing a lot more. And so here's the interesting thing to think about. Even though uh, we industrialize countries such as Canada and the U.S., although we don't have uh, the population that other countries do, boy, we sure use more than our fair share of energy. Uh, so it kind of makes you wonder whether or not the distribution of energy on the planet is even fair or not. Of course, there's costs and consequences to our energy industries, and many of these are very, very well known. We know that by burning fossil fuels, we do create a tremendous amount of air pollution. Uh, there's concerns with regards to global climate change as a result of the CO2 that we're dumping into the atmosphere. Uh, whenever we have an oil spill, we know that they're incredibly messy. Uh, we see the damage that's done to wildlife and how many species are killed by, uh, by our accidents. We also see that the cleanup operation for some of these things is, takes a huge toil, very expensive, and they don't really work 100% of the time. There's always a mess left over, often buried underneath the soil. We just try to ignore it. Of course, sometimes the failures can be catastrophic, as in this illustration here showing a, a fire on board an oil derrick out in the Gulf of Mexico. So that leads to the question of what's called sustainable development. And this means, can we think beyond our own present day problems and can we look to the future? What about our children? What about our children's children? Is it possible to keep on growing and developing so that we can keep on having jobs and keep on making money and at the same time provide energy to make this whole thing work? Well, this is an incredibly complicated problem, but to give you some sense of the things that are involved here, in this diagram we can see that Sustainable development for the future involves not just talking about the environment, but it also involves our economy, how we make and use money, for example, and our society. And that these three rings interact with each other. To, each one adds a different viewpoint, if you will, about sustainable uh, development. So, for example, if we look at it from a, a social uh, perspective, from a society perspective, we want to know if everyone's going to be included in the future. Does everyone have an equal opportunity? Are we building communities and making ourselves stronger or are we tearing communities apart? 
The economy, of course, concerns itself with things like jobs, prosperity, and creating wealth for the future, things like the stock market. And, of course, with the environment, we're talking about the natural environment and preserving it and using renewable resources, which we know that we're not going to run out of. Of course, there's overlaps uh, between each one of these things. So between the economy and the environment, we ask ourselves, can we develop a sustainable economy for the future? Uh, between economy and, and society, we ask, can we have a social equality? Can everyone have a fair chance to earn a decent paycheck? Between society and the environment, we talk about things like, uh, can we protect our local environment? And again, we're, we're trying to think about the future. And of course, where all of these overlap, this is where we have the focus of sustainable development. Can we keep on growing and developing uh, and moving forward? But can we also make sure that we have a future, like I said, for our children and for our children's children?